So two weeks ago, I was preaching in the book of Ephesians, and we talked about uh, what it means to live worthy or walk worthy, so walk through life worthy of all the gifts that God gives us. And we talked about uh, different steps we could take, so humility and gentleness and patience and love. And when we take these steps, what do they do? They maintain unity, so they maintain church unity that the Holy Spirit provides, But they don't actually create unity. What creates unity? Well, what we believe. The one faith, the the one spirit, the one God and Father. These are the things that, that, that create unity, what we believe. Now, today, we're actually continuing the theme a little bit of unity. Because in this passage, Paul is still kind of under the topic of unity. What creates unity? So how we live, our our character, and what we believe, but then also how we function as a church, how we, how we walk together as a church, what kind of unites us as a church body, specifically our leadership. So we're going to be looking at how a, a diversity of leadership gifts actually unites us as a church family. And so I was, I was thinking of uh, kind of illustrations that, that, that give us a picture of unity and diversity, and, of course, the one Paul uses here is of a body. Now, we have different parts and different pieces that fit together. But I was also thinking of kind of a, uh, maybe a simpler illustration for us today that, that kind of describes uh, the church. That's that of a puzzle. Uh, has anyone here put together a puzzle recently? A puzzle Okay, there's like one or two hands, three hands. Okay, so apparently puzzles are not in these days. Uh, uh, growing up, my family, we would put together uh, puzzles around Christmas time. And I think there are about a thousand pieces. My attention span didn't last very long, so it was more my other brothers that uh, uh, put together the, these puzzles. Uh, how big was the puzzle that you did uh, recently, Terry, since you raised your hand 800, okay. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good sized uh, puzzle. There, there's, you know, there's small puzzles, 100 piece puzzles, 500,000, 2,000. Uh, on Amazon, you can buy a puzzle that is 40,000 pieces. Uh, and so it's about the size of about half the wall right there. It's pretty, it's six foot tall. I think it's like 20 feet long. Uh, it's like Disney themed. So if you want to cover one of your walls in your house or If you have a 20-foot table uh, with a Disney theme, that's the way to do it. Uh, But that got me thinking, well, kind of what's the the puzzle with the most pieces in it? What's the Guinness World Record uh, for the most pieces in a puzzle? And it's actually uh, this one right here. It was put together in uh, Vietnam, and it is 551,232 pieces. Uh, that was put together in 2011 by an economics school. And I guess when they do really big puzzles like this, the backs of the puzzles are color-coded to kind of be in quadrants, so it's not as impressive as you think. Uh, but, I mean, that's still pretty impressive, 17 hours to do that. How about the, like, the largest puzzle in terms of dimensions? Well, how about this one? Uh, this one is 65,000 square feet. Uh, it's a 12,000-piece puzzle, and it was put together in Dubai. Uh, so if that doesn't impress you, I've brought an equally impressive puzzle uh, from play school, uh, Sprocket. This is a 13-piece puzzle, so if some of you want to do a puzzle later, you can uh, enjoy doing uh, this puzzle. But what I like about kind of a puzzle is that it, it, it symbolizes a little bit of our church body, and that we are made up of different pieces. We have different shapes and, and gifts and callings, and yet we can all beautifully fit together. And I think our passage is talking about the opportunity to see this gift, to see the church come together, to see how all the pieces fit. See, in our passage, Christ gives us a gift, a gift. And we see this in verses 7 through 10, that Christ gives gifts to the church. And I want to read verses 7 through 10, where Christ talks about, where Paul talks about this grace, this gift that God has given us through Christ. 
But each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. This is kind of a a challenging passage to understand, to get. And so it actually helps if we look at the Old Testament passage that Paul is quoting. See, Paul is quoting a psalm here, Psalm 68, verse 18. And in this psalm, uh, God has been driving away his enemies. He's been driving away his enemies as he enters into his sanctuary, into the temple, to dwell with and be with his, his people. And so what does a king do when he drives out his enemies? What can he do when he takes over a land? Well, he can exact tribute from his enemies. And this is what Psalm 68, the original psalm, says. It says, when you ascended on high... You took many captives, you received gifts from people. So what does a victorious king do? He receives gifts, he receives tribute. But what what does the apostle Paul do in our passage today? If you look back down at verse 8, the last line of verse 8, does it say you received gifts from people? No, it actually says you gave gifts to his people. He reverses it. Instead of giving our, instead of receiving, our king gives. Christ gives gifts to his people. See, through Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension to the throne, he has won the right to not only receive tribute, but to bestow blessing, to give gifts. Oh, maybe some of you have, have realized that you know, you should give a gift to someone, and, and instead they end up giving you a gift. You ever had that happen? Maybe uh, you're going to take a friend or family member out to lunch. You're like, come on, let's go out to lunch. I'll, I'll treat you. And what do they do? They end up paying for you. It's like, well, I was going to give you a gift, but now you're giving me a gift. Maybe you've done a gift swap with a friend, and like, you give them, you know, like a, a picture you hand drew, and they give you like a, a really nice and thoughtful, I mean, maybe your picture that you hand drew is nice and thoughtful, but uh, if it's my artwork, it's not going to be so thoughtful. How about when you take your car to a shop and they fix it up and do a great job and they undercharge you what you expect? You feel like you've received a gift. Well, we owe Christ, our King, everything. We owe him absolutely everything. He's our, our, our ruler And yet he gives gifts to us. (laughs) He gives gifts that we're going to see in our passage today. And so what are these gifts? You might have guessed from my title that Christ gives the gift of leadership to his church. So we're kind of looking at the gifts within leadership that Christ gives to us. And I want to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. Now, before we jump into these gifts, these are really gifts that kind of deal with some leadership aspects in the church. There are other gifts. If you look in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 and 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10 and 28, we find other lists of gifts. So if today, as we go through these gifts, you think, well, none of those gifts apply to me. I, don't, I didn't receive any of those from God. Well, that's okay. There are other gifts that you can look at when you go home. These are just some specific gifts. So let's read verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Now this comes back to our theme of unity. See, one way we find unity is through biblical leadership. A body that doesn't have its head isn't going to be very unified, right? Now, Christ is our head, but he gives us kind of other gifts to help us lead and, 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 and go together. Now, when you think of a puzzle, what are the first pieces you find when you put together a puzzle? Yeah, the corners, the edges, right? You, you look for kind of specific pieces. Unless you're really talented, maybe you're doing some center pieces like upside down. That's not what I, I do. I, I look for the edges. And if you're lucky, you find those corners. Well, Christ gave us some edges. He gave us some corners in these gifts of leadership. 
And so let's just look at each one in verse 11. So we're going to look first at apostles. Now, there are two different types of apostles in the New Testament. There's what we call a big A apostle. So a capital A apostle. Now, this is someone who who lived during the time of Christ Jesus and either knew Christ Jesus as one of his 12 disciples or saw Christ Jesus, the risen Lord. This is uh, the, the apostle Paul. And they had special authority granted to them by Christ to write scripture, to set forth like the foundational doctrines in the church, to really launch the early church, to establish the church. I don't think we still have these capital A apostles in the church. I think those have ended. But I don't think the gift of apostleship has ended completely because Paul lists them here. I don't think we can just cross it out because it might make us uncomfortable. And so that's why I have put apostles with a a lowercase a because I think there is a unique apostolic gifting to start new ministries, to, to start new churches that special people are gifted and called to, especially to people that have never heard of Christ Jesus. Now, the word apostle just means one who is sent or a messenger, one who is sent or a, a messenger. So uh, an apostle is sent by God and gifted in a special way. So I, when I think of those that are gifted as apostles, and we, we see kind of people called apostles throughout the New Testament that doesn't refer to the 12 or doesn't refer to Paul, well, they're just people that have been kind of gifted to do ministry in the early church to help spread the gospel, to help start churches. And so as we look at our modern context, I think of missionaries or kind of church planting pastors. I think these are the kinds of people that are gifted in an apostolic way. Now, Daniel Sinclair, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he is a, a missionary, he was a missionary and a, a director of church planting in Africa, and he describes those gifted as apostles this way. He says, God uses apostles in a variety of ministries. They are the kind who tend to make things happen. Oftentimes, they are good at making something out of nothing. Ministry-wise, successfully starting new works from scratch. Generally, there is a history of evangelistic and discipleship fruitfulness. Now, someone I think of as an apostle or gifted in an apostolic way is Terry Marone. Now, I don't know if he would identify himself as being gifted in an apostolic way, but he is a uh, kind of a director of church planting in France, and he's really helped raise up that whole ministry. He's been in leading it and, and helping it flourish and develop, and he's seen fruit. He's seen the kind of the church spring up in France. Maybe some of you know who this is. He, he's come to Cornerstone a couple times. He's, he's preached here. We've given him uh, gifts. But he really fits in that missionary role of helping raise up the church in France. So I believe God gifts the local church with apostles, with the people of the apostolic gift, and they're often missionaries. Now how about prophets? That's not controversial at all, right? Uh, we're all about uh, the gift of prophecy, right? As a, as a modern church, we're like, man, we love it when people can tell us the future. And that's what many of us think about when we think of apostles, right? We think of, uh, of, of prophets. We think of someone who prophesies and who, who says, this is what's going to happen. Now, we actually see examples of that in the New Testament. We see Agabus. Maybe some of you know him. I, uh, he's a, what a great name. Aren't you sad that you weren't named Agabus? But he predicted a severe famine, Uh, And he also warned Paul that if he went to Jerusalem, he would be imprisoned. So this this was someone in the early church who was gifted with prophecy. But I I don't think prophecy is limited to future telling. I think that's a part of it, but I think prophecy, the, the scriptures actually says that it, it is meant to strengthen and encourage and comfort the local church. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So there's kind of this exhortative role, this this role of someone who can encourage and and perhaps in moments of uh, kind of being full of the Holy Spirit speaks something about the future, 
But ultimately, there's a huge chunk of that gifting that's just about this, these three things. Now, if we think we can ignore prophecy in the early church, then I think we should turn to 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says this. He says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So maybe one of you emails me this week and says, Jonathan, like I have a prophecy for the church. I'm excited to give it. And I'll say, okay, well, <laughs> let me get the elders and, and we'll compare your prophecy, what you think is going to happen to the scriptures. Does it line up with what we see uh, is, is allowable under the scriptures? And then, well, does it actually happen? And if it doesn't happen, we can't just kind of change the prophecy to kind of fit, uh, you know, what we wanted to, it to, to originally say. We really need to test these, these, these prophetic moments. But I think that can be sometimes overcomplicating this because I think without ever calling ourselves prophets, we can have moments of prophetic utterances just through life together as we speak encouraging moments to each other and as we're telling each other about what's going on in our hearts and our minds and we say, you know, Jonathan, if you, if you kind of go down this path, this is what's going to happen. And so why don't you go down this path? Well, I think that's a, that's a prophetic moment. I've, I, I, it's pretty cool. Sometimes I've actually uh, seen it in, in, in preaching. I think preaching can have uh, an element of prophecy in it where you're speaking to the church on a subject and lo and behold the church begins to go through that subject that topic uh, maybe the topic is conflict and peacemaking and then the lord gives us an opportunity to go through conflict and peacemaking so i really got to be careful what i choose to preach about uh, i'm going to preach on like uh, exponential growth next uh, that'll be my next uh, series that doesn't always happen, but sometimes these moments line up, and it's really cool to see. So I think that God gifts the local church with prophets, with prophetic utterances. But the, the passage doesn't stop there. It also talks, talks about evangelists. Evangelists. Now, what is an evangelist? An evangelist is someone who is gifted by God to share the gospel. The word for gospel in the New Testament is euangelion. Euangelion, which means good news. Now, in Greek, evangelist is euangelis. Euangelis. So you can kind of hear gospel, euangelion, evangelist, euangelis. And so what is a, a, an evangelist? Well, someone who preaches the gospel, who shares the good news. And what is the good news? Well, uh, we like to narrow it down to the, the, the message of Christ Jesus, his his life, his death, his resurrection. And if you repent of your sins and put your faith in him, you receive salvation. That's kind of the core of the gospel. But the, the gospel in the New Testament really can be like the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ. It's a very broad message. Evangelists are people that are gifted in talking about Jesus and sharing the, the ministry and the message and the, kind of the, the core message of, of Christ Jesus. I think evangelists also have a tendency to see that bear fruit, to see people hear them talk about the gospel, and then, well, they repent, and they put their faith in Christ Jesus. I think uh, we all are called to be evangelists. I don't think any of us can say, well, I don't have to share about Jesus. I don't have to tell about uh, tell others about Jesus because, you know, I'm not, I'm not gifted or called to it. No, I don't think the Bible allows for that. I think we're all part, uh, we're all to be sharing the message of Christ Jesus. But I think some people are specially gifted with kind of fruitfulness in that role and, and clarity. I used to uh, work uh, with someone who I think is an evangelist. So I, uh, in seminary, I, I worked at a fish tank cleaning company one day a week and uh, it was called Living Water Aquariums. And the, the guy that <laughs> owned it, I don't know why that's funny, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy. Um, the guy who owned it is a Christian. Uh, I think he said he named it that company because he was hoping people would ask him, well, what is the living water? And over the course of 15, 20 years, he said one person asked him. So 
Uh, maybe if you ever bump into him, you can ask him. Uh, that will double his, uh, his score. Um, but he would get opportunities to share the gospel. And he told me once, like he, he got the opportunity to share the gospel with his neighbor, and his neighbor right there put his faith in Christ. I think that's probably someone who is gifted in evangelism. And I think there are a couple people in our church who have this gift as well. God gifts the local church with evangelists. I think evangelists, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but I think part of their role is also to help us, to help everyone else learn how to evangelize. (laughs) Because if you're not gifted in it, what can you do? You can go and you can find someone who who does have that gifting and say, hey, can you share a few secrets with me? Like, how how do you go about this? What, What drives you in this area? They'll probably give you like a frustrating answer. Oh, it's just my love for the Lord. Well, no, like help me understand. Help me, help me evangelize. So we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors. I've also kind of put this under the bracket of shepherds and elders. So Jesus, he also gives the local church pastors. The ESV, we're, we're reading in the NIV, and it calls them pastors, but the ESV does translate this shepherds. So what does a shepherd do? Think about it for a moment. What do, what do shepherds do? A, a shepherd feeds the sheep. So this is why shepherds in the church, they, they teach God's word, or they preach God's word. They're feeding the sheep God's word. A shepherd goes looking for those sheep that wander away. A shepherd intervenes when the sheep begin to bite and hurt each other, risking getting bit himself. Shepherds help sheep that have been hurt, help bind them up, bind their wounds. How about when a sheep gets caught in thorns, the thorns of sin? What does a shepherd do? A shepherd helps pull the sheep out of the thorns, even if it causes pain to the sheep. How about when wolves come, when kind of the wolves of false doctrine and false teaching and and bad beliefs? Well, what do shepherds do? They they protect the flock. They say, no, this is wrong. This is not correct belief. And the best shepherds, the best pastors, the best elders, they lay down their life for the sheep. Just like Jesus, our great shepherd, laid down his life for us. Peter calls elders shepherds which means elders are pastors. So you get that connection? Pastors are shepherds, shepherds are elders. We see this in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 2. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. This is the Apostle Peter's words, saying that elders are shepherds. So at Cornerstone, we have a board of elders that, 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 that does these things that I talked about as shepherds. They, they, they care for the flock. They feed the flock. They lay down their lives for the flock. And because we call it a board of elders, sometimes it's tempting to just think about, oh, they're just a board, right? They just run an organization. No, they're, they're called to be shepherds of the sheep. Uh, next Saturday, and uh, not next Saturday, on December 1st, uh, the elders are going to ask the members of the congregation to vote on an elder candidate. And you're not just electing a board member. You're not just saying, oh, I think that person would be good at running an organization. You're saying, this is a pastor. This is someone I look to who, who can care for the flock, who can, who can feed us God's word, who who." is unafraid to wade into the thorns and bring out sheep that have been caught in sin. This is someone that I trust. And so uh, that candidate is Mark Pender. I I hope that you will take time to pray about his candidacy over the course of the next two weeks. Pray about, is, is this someone that God has set forth as a shepherd? Do I want to recognize that calling that that he is a shepherd, that he is a pastor. I know you guys call me like the pastor at Cornerstone, but 
you are free to call John and Terry, Pastor John and pa- Pastor Terry. And uh, if we vote Mark through, Pastor Terry, because that is what a shepherd is. That is what, uh, uh, Pastor Mark, sorry. Uh, that is what an elder is, a shepherd, a pastor. All right. The final one is teachers. Pastors and elders have to be able to teach. The Bible says that very clearly. Pastors and elders have to be able to teach. So anyone who is an elder at Cornerstone has to have the gift of teaching in some capacity. It doesn't mean they have to preach, but some teaching capacity. Now, just because all pastors and elders are teachers does not mean all teachers are pastors and elders. So we have other people in this church who are gifted as teachers, gifted in teaching a small group, maybe an adult small group, or a youth Bible study, or an adult discipleship class, or, or the children's ministry. These are people that are gifted in teaching, and they're all throughout the church. Maybe you're someone who, who sits down with another person and just shares the Bible with them. Well, you're Teaching, you're using a gift of teaching. It can be kind of a group teaching. It can be individual teaching. God gives teachers to the church, and that's a, that's a position of leadership. So let's go back to the puzzle, right? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. The edges of the puzzle are lining up. We're bringing these puzzle pieces together to complete a picture of the church that's beautiful. Christ doesn't give us, the church, th- these gifts of leadership so that we can kind of keep it to ourselves, right? So that, so that teachers can teach themselves or pastors can pastor themselves, but so that they can benefit the whole church body. And so I, I want to talk about the purpose of these gifts. We, we see this, that Christ gives the gift of leadership to equip, disciple, and protect his church. So we, th- we see three purposes here, equipping, discipling, and protecting. Verse 12, we can look back down at that. It says this, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So what is, why does Christ give us leaders? Pastors, shepherds, elders, evangelists, teachers, prophets, apostles, so that they can raise us up. That's what, that's what Terry is doing and, uh, and, and uh, Terry is doing in France. He is raising up other church planters, other ministers. He is raising up other church planters. And I hope that we at Cornerstone, that your elders and shepherds and the teachers that, that we're thinking about, who can I be raising up to, to also experience the teaching and, and fill the ministry role that I am in. Sometimes it's easy to look at a gifted teacher or a, a gifted elder or someone who, like, who is clearly good at what they do and say, wow, you're amazing. You should just keep doing that. And you should just do it all the time. <laughs> but no matter how amazing a corner piece is in a puzzle, they're always just a corner piece. <laughs> they can't be a centerpiece. We don't want to just look at one piece and say, wow, you're a complete puzzle. No, we want to see the whole puzzle. And so what does a corner piece do? It helps bring the puzzle together. And so as pastors and elders and shepherds, we should be equipping, raising other people up, helping helping you discover your gifts and your talents. See, we're all gifted. This isn't the only passage on gifting in the local church. We each have a unique way that God has gifted us to serve the church body. Everyone in here, anyone that that knows Christ Jesus, you have a special way that you can serve the church. And it's our our role to help bring that out. And so if you're someone who's thinking, man, I don't know what my gifting is, well, just come talk to one of your shepherds. Come talk to one of your elders. We would love to, to explore maybe where you're gifted. We can Get you into a ministry, and if that ministry, you know, isn't where you fit, then we'll try another ministry. No harm done. We want to be constantly developing and, and encouraging and, and growing in the ways that God has gifted each one of us. So that's kind of a, a two-way street, right? We want to come to our shepherds and say, help me, but 
we also have to take some initiative, right? We don't want to stay apart from the church. Like we don't want to kind of come to Cornerstone and just sit in the chairs and then go home because then you're not really a part of the church body. You're just, you're just attending. You're just going to the movies. I, I recently uh, did a trip to Savers to, to make a donation, and uh, I took a puzzle to Savers. And as I was transporting this puzzle to my car, somewhere along the way, it came open and the pieces spilled out. And I, I, I put the pieces back in, and then I, I saw one more piece. I'd already put the puzzle in the car, and I was like, okay, I'll grab that piece. I put it in my pocket. It's like, I'll put that piece in my pocket into the puzzle before I donate the puzzle at Savers. And then I got home from Savers, and the piece was still in my pocket. So now there is a puzzle at Savers, and I have the piece, and I will sell it to you for $50. We kind of do that when we remove ourselves from the church body. When we don't use our gifts to benefit the local church, we're taking ourselves out of the picture. And there's a beautiful, you know, like, Maybe it's a nature scene of a bridge and there's a beautiful flowing stream. But then like right where there's supposed to be a deer, (laughs) there's an empty space. Because you're missing (laughs) or you're missing. And so this is why we bring our gifts to serve the church. Because we want to make that that beautiful picture. We want to complete the puzzle. So this ties into how Christ gives us leaders to equip us so that we can be doing ministry together, so that we can complete the puzzle. So if you're thinking, man, I really probably should start to use the ways God has gifted me a little bit more, just come talk to me or one of the other ministry leaders. Let's get you plugged in. The second way is to disciple. The purpose behind uh, God giving these gifts to our leaders is to disciple. Verse 13 says this. It says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So why do we have shepherds? To help us grow, to help us mature in the faith, to help us mature as a, as a church body. One of the best ways to do this is to, uh, is to receive discipleship from someone who is further along in their journey than you. This doesn't have to be an elder. This can be uh, anyone who you respect and admire and say, wow, I can learn something from them. And they say, wow, I can give something to you. God gives us leaders so that they can lead, so that they can bring us forward in our faith. So maybe someone pops into your mind and you think, man, if I spent more time with them, if I got coffee with them and we we read a passage of the Bible together and we prayed through it and we talked about life, I think that would really help. Well, then go talk to them. Form those individual discipling relationships. We can't really systematize that at Cornerstone. We can't make that happen. That's kind of an individual initiative thing. It's like, okay, I need to grow in my faith. I'm going to find someone who can help me grow. Christ gives us leaders to equip and to disciple us. And also to protect us. Verse 14 says this. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. This is an encouraging verse because it it says, well, if we have leaders, if we have shepherds and they are equipping us and discipling us and protecting us, we're going to be okay this is, a, this is a good thing, but it's also a warning. It's also a warning that we can be taken away, that we can be uh, blown back and forth by different doctrines. Man, there are so many things that we can believe today that, that don't line up with the Bible, that don't line up with Christianity. And, and kind of the truth is that our hearts want to believe things that don't line up with the message of Christianity. Second Timothy says this, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. That passage strikes fear in my heart. 
And I hope it, it strikes fear in all of our hearts, like a healthy, respectful fear that our hearts lead us astray. Our hearts lead us away from what the Bible actually teaches. And yet, Christ Jesus said, I know the perfect solution. I'm gonna put shepherds in your life. I'm gonna give you elders. I'm gonna give you teachers. I'm gonna give you people that can make sure that the puzzle piece isn't like wandering off the table. (laughs) The puzzle is with the rest of the puzzle, united with the rest of the puzzle in that one faith, that one Lord, that one baptism, that one spirit. This is incredibly encouraging. Thank you, Lord, for that. Verses 15 and 16 say this. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So this is a a little bit of a a call to all the teachers and all the shepherds to speak the truth in love. And that is not always an easy thing. And I know I personally have failed at that. Yet that's how we're to be shepherds. We're to be kind and loving and caring shepherds. We're to be teachers that have a heart for the sheep. That don't just see the sheep as a commodity to be grown and traded and to further our wealth, but see the sheep, see the congregation as people that we love and care about. So that's an encouragement to all of us. Let's look at each other and see the, the great value God has gifted on each one of us and love each other. And when, when we're doing these things, when we're, when we're humbling ourselves and we're gentle and we're kind and we're loving and we're we're, we're growing in the faith when we're united by what we believe and we're united under biblical leadership, what happens? It says the church grows. It builds itself up in love. As everyone's using their gifts, each part doing its works, our, our puzzle grows from like a, a 30-piece puzzle to a 60-piece puzzle to a 70-piece puzzle. It can grow numerically. But then it can also grow spiritually as the picture on the puzzle becomes a little bit more clear, becomes a little bit more beautiful. And what's the picture on the puzzle? If, if, we're a, if we, the church, are a puzzle, well, the, the picture is Christ Jesus. <laughs> we're becoming more and more like Christ. We're his body. <laughs> we're reflecting the beauty and the goodness of Christ Jesus. Christ gives the gift of leadership to equip, disciple, and protect his church. At Cornerstone, we are a 72-piece puzzle, according to the last count. That means we are 72 members and attenders. That means people that come regularly, faithfully every week, people that come every once in a while. The question is, where do you fit into the puzzle? Are you a part of the puzzle? Or maybe you're a shepherd or a teacher. That's great. But there are other gifts. You might not be one of those gifts, and that's okay. Because God created you just as special in a different way. And so my encouragement to each one of us is to find your place in the puzzle. Find where you fit in this church. If you're not sure, go talk to a corner piece. <laughs> Go find one of those edges and latch on to an edge. See, when you're here and you're using your gifts, we as a church are complete. We're whole. We look like what we're supposed to look like. And it's a beautiful thing. Christ gives the gift of leadership to equip, disciple, and protect his church. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word Thank you for those leaders that you have given us. Lord, thank you for uh, our elders. Thank you for John as he prayed for us earlier and the gifts that he brings to the board. And thank you for Terry and the ways that he has such a shepherding heart. And I pray for Mark, Lord, as we consider whether or not 
We want to call him to be an elder, shepherd, pastor at Cornerstone. Would you bless him in this process? And would we each think about him and his gifts and his callings? Lord, I pray for this church. Would we be built up in love? Would we have unity as a church? It doesn't mean we all look alike. We are together, and we're reflecting Christ Jesus. Do you help us do this? Help us each find our place. Help us each find where we fit in. I pray that you would bless this church, Lord. Bless Cornerstone. She's your bride. She's your church. She's beautiful. In Jesus' name, amen.